TNWildlife.org is your direct link to the Tennessee Wildlife Resources Agency. Log on for the latest information about hunting, fishing, boating, or wildlife watching right here in our state. You can purchase a license to hunt, fish, or register your boat right online. Check it out today at TNWildlife.org. This week on Tennessee Outdoor Journal, we'll start off with fishing the attractors. When the water got cold, uh, that's when we started seeing more bass show up. Next up, Archery 101, the release. A very smooth trigger on it, it's got a double door. So you flip it open, you like that, you're ready to shoot. And we'll talk about the actual hook. We'll talk about the lure you put on the hook. And the real secrets of Wacky and Nico Rigi. Then we'll finish off with ground blind tips. It creates a dark void inside that the deer can't see into. They can't see you. Tennessee Outdoor Journal is opening the cover and inviting you in for some outdoor tips, tricks, and behind the scenes look at the work being done by your Tennessee Wildlife Resources Agency. Let's turn the page. What kind of legacy will we leave when our days upon this earth are gone? Tell me who will carry on this work that we've begun. Care enough to be the keeper of the dream. Thanks for joining us on this episode of Tennessee Outdoor Journal. We've all heard the old saying, it's fishing, not catching. Well, the Region 2 Fisheries crew has been working for years to improve angler success by creating habitat on our area lakes. We've been doing this for decades, really. I mean, the agency has. We've been putting out specifically these pipe structure attractors that we, that's the design that we, that we use now. We've been putting those out for, I'd say, maybe six, seven years. So, to, I mean, we've got a bunch of them out right here. There's probably 75 or so out in this area, 75 attractors. So once you throw your buoy out, you just kind of fan cast to different spots. And once you figure out where they're at, you just keep keep throwing to that area and, and just pound it till you keep, keep catching fish. But you know, the proof is in the pudding. So today, Ted Alferman to and Philip Parsley are gonna go out and see what they can catch on some of these fish attractors. Uh, I'm using a uh, Bobby Garland baby shad on a 132nd ounce jig head. There's always a little guesswork with it. Uh, I've got my go-tos, but um, you know, usually you try to have, if there's multiple people in the boat, you try to get people to use different lures and whatever they're Whatever they're biting on, that's what I want to be using. There he is right there. Just like it's supposed to happen. Maybe I'll be close. Oh yeah. He's I figured tanned. a fish guy could just look at him and tell. Well, I didn't want I, I, me, and, <laughs> me and Philip will make estimates on in millimeters, because we always measure in millimeters, but I wasn't going to say nothing, but I knew he was good. Over the past several years, thousands of fishing structures have been constructed and placed in area lakes. Crews went out and electroshocked on those sites to see how productive these structures are. We've been doing a research project, project targeted at determining whether these attractors actually work. You know, we don't want to be putting in fish attractors, spending all the time building them, putting them in if, if it's not working, if they're not attracting fish for anglers. So we set out a couple of years ago, we started first on Old Hickory, electrofishing these specific attractor sites and comparing it to nearby control sites where we didn't have any habitat visible. And, uh, and we, we found that they do in fact work really well and uh, it's worthwhile doing. <laughs> What we've been trying to do lately is put them more in a cluster uh, to create more of like a, a tr it look like a, you know, a tree underwater, just a really tight 
area with uh, some good interstitial space that the fish can feel like they can hunker down in and hide and also to ambush prey fish. So if I see a fish tractor like that and I know I'm going to fish tractor site, mm -hmm. it's not just right there. Though. That's right, it's not just right there at the buoy. Sometimes you've got to you know, use your electronics, work around the buoy a little bit and see where they're specifically at. This is just kind of marking the general area. Usually I'll fish these for about 15 minutes or so and then we move on to the next one. Just kind of keep hopscotching around until we find the one that they're at. So most of the sites that we have on Old Hickory and Percy Priest and even on Cheatham Reservoir are all buoyed. But what we've started doing lately is uh, putting out unmarked sites and it, what it does is it it makes it so that you don't have as much of the community hole effect not everybody knows that it's there um, but of course we we don't make these secret we say they're unmarked but they're not a secret uh, all the the gps coordinates are on our website you can go on our website tnwildlife.org and you can um, click on the fishing and boating access link and they all show up on the online gis site so uh, there's no secrets there but um, but it does give anglers an opportunity um, to fish several different spots, some that are marked and some that are unmarked. You ask any angler, you read any fishing report, and part of what's in that fishing report is the depth, and the depth matters, certainly. And so on a lake like Percy Priest, where you have a drawdown up to seven feet in the wintertime, uh, there's certain attractors that come into play at certain times of year as opposed to others and you also have to pay attention to the thermocline. So below the thermocline is where you have colder, uh, unoxygenated water. In the summertime when it gets hot, uh, the lake stratifies and up above the thermocline you've got oxygenated warmer water. So uh, that's, those are all things that fishermen and, and fish obviously themselves consider whenever they figure out where they want to be. And so we've also got to adapt and, and have fish attractor locations that are in different, different depths and uh, different locations, whether that's out on a, a main lake point or back in a cove, things like that. And we're trying to spread those out in a variety of locations so that anglers at any time of the year or any season, they've got a place where they can go and fish. And while Ted and Philip are chasing crappie, multiple species use these sites. Look at that. I had to fish, right? They clearly produce for bass. And what's unique is uh, what we found with our, our research project is that uh, counter to what you really, uh, what an angler would think, in the winter time is when we really got the best results with these attractors, anywhere from November to uh, let's say the first of May. When the water got cold, uh, that's when we started seeing more bass show up on the attractors and more crappie. Now's a great time, and maybe the best time of year, to actually get out here and fish these attractors. All right, folks, welcome back to our Archery 101 segments. Uh, we're uh, here at the Archery Den with Logan White. Uh, he's going to walk us through the release for the bow. So uh, there's many types out there, and they've got them all right here at the Archery Den. He's going to show us a couple that he likes and uh, tell us about one that he's not so hot about, but they're a great release, so go ahead. So like you said, Jason, there's a couple different releases, um, on different types of releases on the market. The first most common one used by hunters is gonna be a wrist release. This particular wrist is the hard, hardcore. Um, it falls down out of your way. It's got a very smooth trigger on it. It's got a double joint. So you flip it open, you like that, you're ready to shoot. Um, you got to pull this one back to open it up, clip it in the loop like that, it'll shut. And as you're drawing it back, just keep your finger behind the trigger. You hit your anchor point, lay on top when you're ready, just ease over, and then you just, you just ease that trigger back. And this is going to be a trigger release, wrist release. Um, similar to a gun. If, similar yeah. to a gun, yeah. That's exactly right most commonly used you know um, user friendly it's right there put it on you're good to go mm -hmm. I like this one it flips down out of your way so it, you know you've been sitting all day or 
trying to get in your backpack or climbing your ladder, whatever you're doing, this gets out of your way. It, it doesn't rattle, it doesn't make noise. So it it's, makes life a little bit easier. And then when it's game time, flip it up and you're ready to go. Okay. So that's gonna be your wrist release. Um, many of brands on the market. Um, the second one, the one I personally shoot. Your favorite. Yep, is a thumb release. Um, <clears throat> this is a B3 exit. It's gonna be a beginner level thumb release. This changes everything. Um, so if you know you're gonna shoot a thumb release, you want to bring it with you or let us know when we're setting up your bow because it changes your anchor point, which changes your peep and the angle of your string. Um, but when you go to this, this is, you know, it's gonna be a little bit more advanced. Um, the way you hold these is different. You come to, um, to put it on the bow, you open it, you put your loop through, and then you, you push this one shut, and it's completely shut on your, on your loop. So when you, you bring it back, you're, you're kind of standing there like this, and as you draw, you twist. Your anchor on the thumb release compared to the um, wrist release is going to be quite different. A wrist release is going to anchor up here underneath your earlobe, right underneath your earlobe for most people. That's where we, where most people like to anchor. The thumb release, it, it creates a V in your fingers right here, okay? So when you take that V, if you can imagine your jawbone right here, the bottom finger of that V is gonna go on the bottom of that jaw and the top finger of that V is gonna go above that, that jawbone right there. And that's going to create your anchor to shoot the thumb release properly. Like I said, it's going to change your anchoring points, which is going to change your peep, where you're hitting, and that kind of thing. Right. So once you got it drawn back, you put a little bit, you put pressure on the thumb right here, but you don't pull your thumb to shoot it. You rest your thumb and you drive your elbow straight back. And as you're driving back, that's putting more and more pressure of your thumb on here and that's what makes it shoot. Okay. Um, when I started shooting this, I started shooting this, Matt talked me into it. Um, he actually tried to talk me into a back tension release. It's going to be really advanced. I can't shoot them. I don't like to shoot them. Um, I may or may not have missed the target trying to shoot <laughs> um, Everybody misses every now and again. Right. So, good thing we were inside. <laughs> but. Um, so I went to the to the thumb release. Matt got convinced me to try it. I absolutely loved it. It has made me a better shooter, more accurate. Um, I'm getting farther ranges now. Mm -hmm. um, so I've been shooting one of these for about two and a half, three years now. And uh, like I said, they're a little more advanced, but they're a whole lot more user friendly than a back tension. Um, back tensions are the best. You have to have perfect form to shoot them. Um, that may be why I can't shoot them very well. <laughs> but, uh, so those are going to be your three types of releases. And the sky's the limit between the three. I mean, yeah. um, the the prices, you know, this release right here for a wrist release, I want to say a hardcore is going to be around 100, 115 bucks. Um, this is a beginner level thumb release and it starts out at 130. Um, and then back tensions are a little bit more expensive, but you have wrist releases that are $25. So there's one for everybody, mm -hmm. any price, we can get you in a release. And if you just want to, uh, if you've got your bow set up and you want to upgrade your release or you've got a really good wrist and you're thinking about going to the thumb, come in, see us, we get you in a thumb, we can tune it to the thumb and you're, you're back shooting the same day. Awesome, awesome. So now what about those uh, hardcore guys that want to just use the leather patch and two fingers? That, <laughs> that we can definitely get the leather gloves or the thumb rings or any of that kind of stuff, the tabs. We have some stuff in stock. Most of that we order because a lot of people don't shoot that anymore. Don't see it much anymore. Um, actually had a customer in a couple weeks ago. He lives in Kentucky and uh, He's law enforcement for the Kentucky parks, and that's all he shoots is a traditional bow, 
and he shoots a, a thumb. And a thumb ring, it literally, it's a ring traditionally, like if you went by what the Indians did, they made them out of bone. And it would slide over and there was a little cup in it. And you would put the string in that cup and as you drew the bow, you would straighten your thumb and it would shoot the arrow. They're really neat to watch a guy shoot that and mm -hmm. it's really, it's even better when he's good. So that was pretty cool to actually see that in person. I'd only ever seen it on YouTube and things like that. Wow. Well, Logan, thank you for that rundown. Uh, they've got what you need here at the Archer Den. Uh, no matter what kind of release you need, uh, so come in and try them out. Find the best one for you and uh, get out there and start practicing. Hey everybody, Jason Holland with Jason Holland Fishing, here to give you the real secrets on wacky rigging and Nico rigging. Today we're going to talk about wacky rigging and Nico rigging. Crazy names, really what does it mean? What it really means for you is extremely finesse fishing, but a great fish and catch machine. So we're going to walk through the rod and reel setup, we'll talk about line, we'll talk about the actual hook, we'll talk about the lure you put on the hook, the soft plastic, we'll talk about how you tie it, also, importantly, where you throw it. So let's dive in, stay tuned, got a lot of good stuff for you. I'm starting off with the Cashin Fishing Rod, this is the John Cruz Signature Series Rod, and uh, really designed for uh, a lot of different finesse type applications, weightless all the way up to typically a 5 8 or so. But this rod itself is a 7 wood, medium heavy, fast action, uh, really fast tip, which I love uh, in finesse and lightweight situations. Jumping over the reel, this is a Daiwa Tatula 2500 series. And from there, we've got Sunline. Uh, this is the high vis yellow uh, 16 pound braided line. And that goes to our leader material which is sunline sniper this happens to be the eight pound test you can do eight you can do down to six you can go up to ten really whatever the uh, situation is uh, but that's your rod reel line setup all right let's talk about the business end of it which is the hook a lot of different versions uh, we're going to focus on a couple main ones uh, today that you're going to use when it comes to wacky rigging and nico rigging uh, they're very much the same, just a little bit for how you position the hook and the weight uh, will really determine the weightless wacky rig or the Nico. So first off, we'll start with, this is the Gamagatsu G Finesse Stinger Hook. Uh, this is a size one, and as you can see, it's got a couple of unique features. One, uh, you've got these two titanium weed guards. And really what that does is uh, helps you around branches, around logs, around weeds, just gives the uh, ability to come through some thicker, heavier cover stuff by having this weed guard. And also, as you can see, it's got a longer shank, which is really important when it comes to wacky rigging. Another version of the wacky rig is the weighted wacky rig. Again, as you can see, it's got a weed guard here, but the difference is this has a 1 8 lead head poured into it. So all this does is it gives you the ability to cast a little bit further, your sink rate speeds up and allows you to be a little bit more efficient. Uh, another great option. And then from there, we've got some Nico weights. Uh, this is a, uh, a football head Nico weight into a screw lock. And then this is the missile baits uh, Nico weight. And then you've got the wacky tool. And we'll kind of walk through now how you put all this together. So what is a wacky rig? A wacky rig is typically a weightless worm that you take and you hook wacky style. Well, all that that means is you hook that, I like to, a couple ways you can do it, I just kind of fold it over the middle and just start with, and what you're going to do is you're going to hook that bait right in the middle. And what it does is, uh, again, I know, it looks bad, looks funky, but that is the setup. And what happens is, is that as it comes through the water, uh, the weight of the water pushing against it, it gives this action as it goes through. And typically you have a heavier portion of plastic over here. Uh, which helps that overall wobble. Uh, sometimes they call it the wiggle. And really what this is shines is really high pressured areas, areas where uh, it's getting a lot of people are fishing it, throwing a lot of different things, and you need to slow down, get more of a finesse type presentation. Uh, the wacky rig is a great way to catch them. 
Other good thing is they skip extremely well. So say you're fishing on the bank and you've got a boat dock that sticks out in the water. You can take it, sidearm cast it, and skip that up underneath the boat dock. A really great tool to catch them. And that's really the, that's really the rig. You take that, you tie it uh, directly to your line, and just cast it out weightless. It's a really great tool to catch fish. Uh, and they call it wacky for a reason because you're right, it does look very wacky. Uh, same type of deal when you look at uh, the weighted wacky. All that this is, as we said earlier, is same type of weight you rig it. Uh, you can go offset a little bit or you can go right in the middle of uh, your soft plastic. And all that this does is gives it a little bit of weight here as it falls. Uh, it's going to fall again like this and it's going to get that action as it comes down. Just helps you cast a little bit further, rate of fall is a little bit quicker. Now, that's the wacky rig. There's the weightless, weighted version of it, pretty straightforward. Now, we'll talk real quick about uh, the wacky O tool. And really, what this is, is a tool that you can put O rings on your soft plastics and actually hook your hook into the O ring and not the soft plastic because uh, it has a tendency to tear. All you'll do is you'll take uh, this is a Yamamoto Senko, which is the classic. Put that into your tool. Typically, I kind of go in that, as you can see on the swarm, it's kind of got an egg sac there. I really shoot for the middle, give or take. Uh, get it where you want it, and then all you got to do is just slide this old ring up your tool, and then it'll just snap right off onto your worm. So now, when you hook it, instead of hooking it directly through your soft plastic, you'll actually hook it through the o-ring get it down here where you can see it and there you go so now as that hook is pulling and the weight is actually pulling on the o-ring and not the soft plastic it'll extend the life of your soft plastics now talk about the nico rig really nico is taking a wacky rig and just adding some weight to it and repositioning where your hook is at that's fundamentally what it is so uh, we got our Cinco. What we're going to do is we're going to hook it. Again, here's our head. What we're going to do is, I'll show you real quick. Here's our Nico weight. Stick the, Nico, the weight into the head of your Senko. Or uh, another great product to do that on is the Missile Baits 6.5 Quiver. Uh, fantastic bait to Nico rig as well. So there's your setup. You've got your O-ring, and then you've got your weight in it. And then, again, this is going to fall nose down. Take your hook. And hook it, as you can see, directly through here and catch your O-ring. So now, as you cast this out, this bait is going to bottom hop. That way it's going to keep that nose on the ground. And it's a great way, especially if you've got kids, um, just getting into fishing. This thing is a fish catching magnet. Great way to do it. Nico rig it. Uh, you've got the... Uh, Missile base Nico weights, and then you've also got the football head screw in. But it's just a matter of instead of doing a wacky, which is, uh, as we talked about, sideways. Uh, so all we're doing now is putting the weight on it, and we're repositioning our hook to turn it into a Nico, way, uh, a Nico rig. A couple of products that I like real fast we'll talk about. We talked about the Missile 6.5 Quiver, uh, Gary Yamamoto 5-inch Senko. And then also a Bass Pro Shops. This is the uh, Wacky Worm. Uh, it's a really cool little bait. I'll show you real fast. And really what it does is it helps accentuate the flapping action as it comes down. As you can see, uh, it's heavier weighted on each end. And it's got a thinner piece in the middle. Uh, and so it gives that, uh, that flapping action as it falls. Uh, it little helps it along the way. Thanks for joining us. Hopefully you learned something about Wacky Rigging and Nico Rigging. Appreciate the TWRA for allowing me to come along. And hopefully you got some real secrets. Look forward to seeing you next time. Ground blinds have become a popular tool for deer hunters over the past few years. Today, I thought I'd give you a few tips to help you get the most out of your time in a blind. Blinds are made with camouflage material but deer live in these woods 24 seven. So if you walk out in the morning and pop up a blind, they're gonna notice. So how do you keep from sticking out like a sore thumb? The key is to brush the blind. Most blinds these days come with loops that allow you to attach natural material to the blind. 
obviously the more you add the better but the goal is to break up the hard edges of the blind to make it blend into the environment windows that is the catch-22 of the ground blind hunter we want to see everything we want to have all those windows open but if you've got all the windows open the deer can see in the key to hunting out of a blind is to allow as little light into the blind as possible. That creates a dark void inside that the deer can't see into. They can't see you. So you only open the windows that are on the side that you expect to see deer traveling. Now, if something were to happen and a deer was behind you, you could close the windows in the front and open the ones in the back. But you'd never have them open all at the same time because you're a silhouette and the deer will see that. Where you place your blind has a lot to do with your success as well. If you know a direction of travel for these deer, set your blind off to the side so that they're passing you, not walking directly at you. You don't want to be in their direct line of sight. Hunt the wind. This one is one that you cannot ignore anytime you're in the deer woods. If you're hunting a field or a trail and you know that's where they're gonna be, put your blind on the downwind side. That way the deer can't use its nose and smell you. You can't beat a deer's nose. This is especially important if you're bow hunting and you need that animal to get close, but even with a gun, hunt downwind, you'll see more deer. So there you have it. A ground blind is a great alternative to hunting out of a tree stand. They are portable, they conceal your movement, you can hunt anywhere, you don't need that perfect tree, you don't need any tree. And on a day like today, it's way more comfortable in that blind than it is 20 feet up in a stand. I hope if you're considering going out and using a ground blind, these tips were helpful to you and I hope you have a great hunt. Thanks for joining us on this episode of Tennessee Outdoor Journal. We'll see you next time. Tennessee Outdoor Journal is produced by your Tennessee Wildlife Resources Agency. Hi, I'm Charlie Daniels. So when I was a kid, I loved baseball and football and all kinds of stuff, but my favorite pastime was when my daddy would get me up early in the morning, we'd go hunting or fishing. Out in the fresh air, on the water, or back in the woods, and you learn a lot. You got kids, take them hunting, take them fishing. Join me, buy a hunting or fishing license. Let's keep wildlife in Tennessee. That's a doggone good thing. Buy your license today at GoOutdoorsTennessee.com. Hi, I'm Tracy Lawrence, just letting you know that the Tennessee Wildlife Resources Agency supports itself and manages all of the state's wildlife with the dollars invested by hunters and fishermen when they buy licenses. If you've never bought a license, but appreciate the abundant wildlife we enjoy in this state, I encourage you to do it. Start with the Type 01. It's a great investment in Tennessee wildlife. Learn more at tnwildlife.org. Buy your license today at GoOutdoorsTennessee.com.